magic. <laughs> Excellent. Hello, 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 welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Washington DC training webinar. Um, I, I'm Emily Taylor with the Solve MECFS initiative. I'm here with Gail Cooper. Gail, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I can't I wait to you see you all know in a couple days. <laughs> Um, wonderful. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping items um, just to review briefly. Um, so about the webinar, this is our MECFS Advocacy Week training. This webinar is specifically for folks who are coming to DC. So um, if you are not coming to DC, well, you're welcome to, to join and share in the information, but some of this might be a little boring for you. Um, the webinar will be recorded and the recording will be made of, available on YouTube um, as soon as possible, hopefully by the end of the day. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll fingers crossed that we can get that uploaded as quickly as possible. It will be on the, the Solve MECFS initiative YouTube, which you can see the link there, um, and also on the ME Action YouTube, and the link is there. And we'll also make sure to get the, um, the PDF versions of the slides available as well. Um, so uh, just a quick note about kind of the webinar housekeeping and how they, to use the functions of the webinar. Um, there is a question box on the right-hand side um, which you can use to ask questions. Um, unfortunately, our tech capacities are slightly limited because we're broadcasting from DC, so we don't have the full tech capacities of the SMCI office that we usually have. So you're gonna see a little bit more of the back uh, end of like, you'll see my mouse moving around and you'll see like little highlights and things like that. So normally you wouldn't see those things, um, but you'll see them now because we don't have our full tech set up. Um, our communications and engagement coordinator, Chris, is going to be recording and assisting um, with selecting people for questions and unmuting and, and remuting people. Um, we actually have a very small audience today because we're just broadcasting just for the folks um, in the DC uh, contingent. So, um, so we might just at one point, if things are, are you know, going well, just unmute everybody. So just keep an eye on your microphone. Um, if it gets too loud, you know, background noise, we'll, we'll go ahead and mute you. But um, we should be able to have a little bit more of a conversation, a little bit more interaction than usual because um, we have such a small group with us. Um, so we will do actually two Q&As in this presentation. Um, and uh, we've divided the presentation up by logistics and then content for the briefing or for the, for the meetings themselves. Um, so we'll have, a, we'll have a break in the middle to do questions um, on one part, and then we'll have questions at the end as well. Um, you can use the raise hand function on your right-hand side during the Q&A, which will get you in line to ask a question. Then Chris can unmute you, and he'll call out your name when he's unmuting you. Um, we're, usually we do one speaker at a time, but again, um, if things are going well and if the sound is working for everybody, we'll, we'll try and get a, a, a bit more conversation going for this webinar. Um, so now I'm going to, um, to begin the uh, the recording part, so this will be the part that's going to end up on YouTube. Um, so Chris, I'm going to flag you to get ready to record. Um, there'll be a few moments of silence as we get all those details in line, and then we'll begin again. So thank you all for your patience. Thank you for joining us, and we're going to get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. This webinar is for MECFS Advocacy Week 2017. Um, welcome to Washington for our DC travelers, uh, advocates coming from across the country to, co to conduct their advocacy meetings direct on Capitol Hill. My name is Emily Taylor. I'm the Director of Pol uh, Advocacy and Public Relations for the Solve MECFS Initiative, and I'm here with our partner organization, uh, ME Action, and Gail. Gail, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, hi everybody. My name is Gail Cooper and I'm the chair of Congressional Action for ME Action. And I'm lovely to be here. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. So this presentation is divided into two parts. Um, we're going to start with our agenda, Welcome to DC. We're going to go over the DC schedule for 2017, what to expect throughout the day, a little bit of Capitol Hill navigation, safety and resources, and this will be all very logistical information for the, the two days that we'll be in DC. And then we'll take a break for Q&A, and then we'll go into the meetings themselves. We'll um, go over the information we will provide to you, how to prepare for your meetings, some guides and facts about um, what you can provide during the meeting, and of course, we'll walk through um, a sample agenda for the meeting. Um, for anyone who's attended our previous advocacy training webinars as part of MECFS Advocacy Week, some of this information will be repeated, as some that you've seen before, um, but this is going to be DT specific, so we'll be a little bit more honed in about what you'll be specifically talking about with your legislators in Washington, D.C. Wonderful. So we'll just go ahead and dive right in. 
Um, so here is the schedule of events for Washington, D.C. Um, I apologize if anything at the bottom got cut off, but again, all of this information is available on our MECFS Advocacy Week website, which you can get to by going to the Solve MECFS website, which is solvecfs.org. On the right upper hand corner, you'll see a tab that says Get Involved. When you select that tab, there'll be an MECFS Advocacy Week uh, button there, and you can just click on that button and it'll bring you to the page where all of this information is housed. Um, so these are the detailed schedule of events that we'll be having while we're in D.C. The first event is on Tuesday morning, Tuesday, May 16th, which is our in-person D.C. advocacy training and breakfast. Um, it'll be going from 8.30 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. in the McDermott Building, which is um, about a five-minute walk uh, in between the Senate side and Union Station. So if you're coming on the Metro, and we'll get into that in a moment, you'll be taking the Union Station stop, and it'll be closer to the Senate side. Um, that The address is there below at 500 North Capitol Street. Um, we are in the Rotunda Conference Room. So when you come to the door, there is security. So you, um, please, just a reminder, if you are attending the in-person DC event, be sure to email me your information so that I can get you on the list for security. Um, and then they'll just check you right in and show you upstairs to the Rotunda Conference Room. Um, this event is for in-person introductions. We'll be going over training and materials distribution, same as, um, as we'll be doing a bit in, the per in person on the day of. Um, it is an opportunity for folks to get familiar with what we're doing, um, get, get the same information here that we're providing um, uh, in terms of training and ask questions um, at, in person. And also a really delicious breakfast, which we're very excited about. Um, and so that'll happen on Tuesday morning. Um, so Tuesday afternoon, you're pretty much free to, to, uh, to do uh, what you please. Um, there's um, a lot of really great uh, museums that are all free, not too far away. And I'll point out some interesting items when I go through the map um, that are nearby that might be fun to, to attend. Um, of course, you know, for patients who are more severe, it's an opportunity to rest. Um, we wanted to give you as much time as possible to rest and get ready for the very busy day on Wednesday. So the next item on there you'll see is Wednesday, May 17th, the pre-storm welcome and light breakfast. This will be at 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. Um, this will be at the area that we've, we've uh, called the MECFS Command and Control Center, a.k.a. the rest area. Um, this is our own room that we have for the whole day um, just for our, our organization and for our efforts. Um, it's at 421 Cannon House Office Building, and again, we'll show you the map in a moment so you see where that is specifically, but the address is there as well if you're going to Google it. Um, it's a very quick opportunity. We'll just kind of welcome, get everybody connected with their teams. There's a light breakfast available, and we'll get you oriented around the Capitol and kind of get fired up and ready to go. Um, the, the, the kind of special event that just kind of came up, so this is a new event that has not been um, communicated previously except by email, is um, there is a rare disease uh, legislative advocates event the same day on Capitol Hill, not too far away, and um, our very own Vice President of Research and Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Zahir Nali, will actually be presenting on MECFS at this event, and they're offering free lunch. So um, that event, if you don't have any meetings scheduled, um, will be Wednesday, May 17th, from noon to 1 p.m. It's about a 10-minute walk away from the Senate side of Capitol Hill. Um, in an uh, office building uh, in Suite 430 at 440 First Street Northwest. Um, there's a link there to register, um, and they'll be talking about rare disease advocacy, policy, how the NIH operates, getting NIH funding. They have a really great, robust agenda, um, including Dr. Zahir Nali speaking specifically about MECFS. And so you do need to register. It is free, and then they will be providing much. Um, so welcome to DC, um, into the breach. So here's how we're going to walk through a little bit of how the day will go. Um, so meetings, the very first meeting started, I think there's only one person with an early morning meeting at 9.30 a.m. Um, so uh, that, that was, that's the earliest meeting we have. And the latest meeting is at 4.30 p.m. so that you'll be done by 5. Um, and, and we have a bit of a hurry up and wait situation. Um, so we've made it so that every meeting has a, hopefully at minimum an hour and a half between your meetings. We, we, there's a couple exceptions, but for the most part, everybody has a pretty wide gap between one meeting and another. So it's a little bit of hurry up and wait, but we did this on purpose because we wanted to give you as much time as you needed to navigate around Capitol Hill and also if you needed to rest in between meetings because we know they can be very taxing, we wanted to make sure you had that time available as well. So, um, so if you have time between, um, if you're healthy, um, you might be, be um, not needing the rest as much, 
but for we wanted to make sure that all the meetings had as much time as possible for patients to rest in between. Um, so just kind of a little a couple of items to be aware of. So the way the day will usually go is we'll have our welcome breakfast in the morning, and we'll get everyone fired up and ready to go. And then everyone's schedules are going to be individual. We'll have your individual schedules emailed out to you. And I know that there's a lot of folks who are very um, anxious to get their schedules, and I do apologize that we, we simply, I got the master schedule last night at 5.30, and I was up till 4 a.m. last night um, trying to get everything put together for everyone. There's a lot of considerations, including families that need to stay together, folks who have less ability to walk, um, making sure you're in your delegation meeting in addition to additional meetings that were requested. So there's a lot of logistics that need to be put together, and I'm really glad that this is an audio-only <laughs> recording because I look a mess today. Um, but we'll hopefully have that out to you no later than um, than tomorrow morning. Uh, and so just to, just to know, there, there are two elements of the meeting schedule that will be emailed out to you. Um, one element will be your individual delegation meetings, and that will be included in your email. And then you will have a customized schedule that will be attached to your email with additional meetings that potentially are outside of your delegation. Um, so just make sure when you get your email to check the attachments as well, and all of that information will be there. Um, so a couple items Emily, to... Uh, uh, Emily, oh, sorry, go ahead. Emily, yeah, Emily, you might want to explain for a moment why people would be meeting outside their delegation. Oh, that's, that's a great point. Um, so because some of the delegations are very small, um, so, for example, we have a couple delegations on areas that only have one person coming from that area, and we do want to make sure all the meetings have at least two people in them, um, you know, buddy system, and, um, and that way we get multiple perspectives so that the, um, the legislators and their staff can see different, different experiences with the disease. So, um, so we have some experienced advocates that will be filling in for the meetings that have small delegations. Additionally, we have some advocates that are very new and have never done this before, and so we, we made sure to exclude that there's an experienced advocate, someone who's been doing this for a while, someone who's very well known, um, who, who's there to kind of work with you, so that everyone will have an experienced advocate, at least a buddy, and no one will be out of their comfort zone. We want to make this as positive an experience as possible for everyone. So there are some folks that will have meetings that are not in their delegation because they're helping out either a delegation that doesn't have more than one person or is, is, um, is double booked, or just because they're helping out a newer advocate that might need a little bit more experience. Um, does that answer that question? Yep. Great. Thanks. Beautiful. Um, okay, so, this, um, so as the meetings progress, you'll have your individual schedule, and so, for example, you might have a meeting that starts at 10, so you'll, you'll make your way to your meeting. Meetings last about 20 minutes, and so then you'll be done by like 10, 20, 10, 30, and then your next meeting might not be until 11.30. So you have that time to go back to the command and control center in Canon, rest up, grab a, grab a cup of coffee, you know, get ready, and figure out where your next meeting is, kind of meet with your next group. So the groups are definitely changing as things go, depending on your meeting schedule. Most groups will stay pretty consistently together, but some groups might shift. So, um, so if you are meeting a new group when you're heading to your next meeting, you want to make sure to arrive at your meeting a little early so you have time to connect with the folks, or you guys can make arrangements to meet at the command and control center and move over together. Um, so a couple items to just keep in mind as, uh, as we go through our day. Um, expect some weird temperature changes, so I recommend dressing in layers. Um, we are expecting some high heat that day, high heat and high humidity, so outside it would be pretty uncomfortable, but then inside they usually keep the air conditioning blasting, and I find myself personally, I get very cold when I'm inside, um, especially if you sweat when you're walking over and then you're kind of wet and cold when you come in from the AC. So, um, so definitely dress in layers and be prepared to have like multiple temperature environments um, as you go through your day. Um, I recommend relaxed business attire, but I highly recommend comfortable shoes. Um, we're, we've really done everything we can to minimize the walking that will be involved, but some of these office buildings are just very large and there's no way around it. So um, we're, we, we've done our best to hopefully have no one more, nothing more than maybe a 10 15 minute walk in one go before you have the opportunity to sit and rest again, but you will be doing some walking, so comfortable shoes, um, and of course the relaxed business attire. Um, again, experienced advocates will be in every meeting, so no one's gonna be going into any of these unprepared. Um, other things to note, um, we, this is a very, very busy time on Capitol Hill. There's at least six other delegations that I know of that are gonna be on the Hill at the same time as us, possibly more. So expect that the security lines might sometimes be long. When you go outside a building to another, inside another building, you will need to go through security again. 
Um, so sometimes the lines get long and you do end up standing outside in the sun, so make sure you stay hydrated. Um, and, you know, especially if standing is something that can be difficult for you, you know, just definitely let the security people know that you have, a, you know, a medical need that you need to get through the line quicker and they can try and accommodate that. Um, so, yeah, so, so I, I, and I'll also make sure to add, because of the security lines, add a little bit of extra time if you know you're going from one building um, into another and we'll have to go through security. I would say add at least another 10 to 15 minutes to your timing to make sure that you have time to get through the security line. Um, security lines get a little bit worse midday um, and a little bit lighter um, early. So just kind of keep that in mind as well. Um, of course, you are always welcome and we highly encourage you to come back to the Command and Control Center, which again is at 421 in Cannon. It's a safe resting place. We'll have pillows and blankets. We'll have some coffee and water and things. Um, that's kind of our, our hub of operations for the day. Um, one thing that this is also new information that was just added, um, we will have a cart and a driver available from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And they will be ours and ours alone. And they will be their job is to task to drive people from one side to the other and back again to minimize walking. Um, walking from the House side, to the, which is on the south, to the Senate side, which is on the north, is usually about 10 minutes for a regular, a regular kind of easy walking pace. Um, but again, the cart and driver will be available to take you back and forth, um, especially the cart has seat seating for seven. So if you're healthier or if you're feeling okay, you might want to try and do the walk um, and save the seats for the people who are more severe. Um, just keep that in mind. But of course, they are available. Um, and we will coordinate with the cart and driver to make sure that they're available at which entrances people need to be at for um, getting rides. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is that some of the buildings don't have any Wi-Fi. Some of them do have public Wi-Fi, but it is generally very slow. So if you do require Wi-Fi or, um, or your data plan is, is uh, close to its max, um, keep that in mind for the, the, the Capitol Hill Wi-Fi is slow if, if, if available at all. Um, so here is the DC map of the metro. And I wanted to go this over this briefly because um, I know a lot of our folks will be using the metro. And the metro is, um, is really fantastic. It's, re you know, it's one of the best public transportation uh, available. So I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Sorry that you get to see my um, thing right here, my little laser pointer. So right in this area here, where you can see my laser pointer circling, this is Capitol Hill. This is where we'll be. You can see that little, that small, little white dome looking thing. That's the Capitol building itself. The Senate side is over on this side, and the House side is over down here. Um, so the best metro stops to use is this Capitol South right here, Capitol South. That is the south side for the House building. So when you're coming in the morning and you're meeting us at Cannon, that's probably the best metro stop to get off at to minimize your walking. There's also this metro station here at Union Station that's closer to the Senate side. Um, these buildings would be right here where it says Judiciary Square. That's about where the buildings are. And it's a very it's about a, a 10 minute walk, I'd say, from Union Station all the way to, to the the, uh, the far side of the Capitol, like 10 to 15 minutes to get all the way from Union Station to Capitol South House Office Building. Um, you can also get off at Judiciary Square, but it's a bit more of a walk because you have to go around the Capitol building. So, you know, so um, I'd recommend Union Station. You can kind of make a straight shot down. Um, if you're taking a line that is not the red line or the orange and blue line, so if you're on, let's say, the green line or the yellow line, um, you do need to change trains. And I just want to heads up, you can change trains at these big circles. These are these, the, the major metro stops where you can change trains. You do need to walk up and down stairs, or they do have escalators when you change trains. So just keep that in mind for your energy allotment when you know you're going to have to change trains at these locations. So you do have to go up and down um, some, some uh, escalators and additional additional energy exertion. Um, so that's the metro stations and kind of where you want to be for the metro. Let me switch back to regular mouse. Let's see. <laughs> Sorry about that. Pause. Go back to, oh, come on, let me go back to my arrow. There we go. Okay. So here's a map of Capitol Hill. And I wanted to go over this, everybody, so that we can see kind of what we're dealing with for the whole day. Um, so um, you see on the right, you have our, um, uh, over here, let me get my pointer again. There you go. On the right here, we have kind of the, the description of where we're going to be. 
This is the best map I could find, and here's the link actually to the map down here, so if you want to see it for yourself, um, and I'll probably email this out to folks as well. Um, and they also have a really great breakdown of kind of um, a lot of the common questions asked about visiting Capitol Hill. Um, so the red buildings here are the house office buildings. We have no meetings in Ford, so don't worry about Ford down here. We have Rayburn, Longworth, and Cannon are our house office buildings down here. Here's that Capitol South Metro I mentioned, so it's very close to Cannon. Um, and then up here in the blue are our Senate buildings, Russell, Dirksen, and Hart. Dirksen and Hart are very closely connected, so they're basically almost one building. Um, and then Union Station, you can see, is a, is a short walk to the north that's not pictured here. We have no meetings in the Capitol building, so don't worry about this section here. Um, all of our meetings are going to be down here in the House side, Cannon, Longworth, and Rayburn, or up here in Russell, Dirksen, and Hart on the blue side. Um, so these little green dots, I hope you can see them clearly on your screen, but again, you can visit the, uh, the, the link if you want to look more closely, are the building entrances. These blue dots are building entrances that are open only after 10 a.m. These are staff-only entrances in the morning so that staff can get in and not have to wait in long lines. Um, so if you have a meeting after 10 o'clock, you can look for these blue entrances, um, but otherwise look for the green entrances to the building. Um, at every entrance, you do need to go through security, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So um, I just wanted to walk through kind of where we'll be walking. So um, the first number in a, in a room number corresponds to where that building is. So Canon down here has basically a zero, so it's only three-digit numbers. So our room, our command and control center, is in Canon 421, four meaning the fourth floor, so we'll be on the fourth floor in Canon, and the elevators are usually about in the center here. So if you go in through an entrance, you can see the elevator is pretty close by, and you head up to the fourth floor. Um, Longworth is one, so anything that's like one, four, two, one would be Longworth, one, fourth floor, four, and then the room number two, one. Rayburn starts with two, so something that was like two, four, two, one would be two for Rayburn, four for the first, fourth floor, and, um, and then two, one for the room number. Um, Russell, Dirksen, and Hart actually have the letters in front, so those are a little bit easier to navigate. So it's like Dirksen 3-2 or Hart 3-2 or those sort of things, so they're not quite as difficult. But, um, but I have which building uh, your room member or your meeting is in um, on all of your, uh, your information. So you should be able to find which building it is pretty easy. Um, the fun thing is that all of these buildings are connected by underground tunnels, and if you use the underground tunnel, you don't have to go through security again. Um, so all the underground tunnels are usually on the basement level. So for example, if you're here in Cannon on the fourth floor, you want to take the elevator down to the basement level and you want to make sure it's the elevator in this corner. Then you go to the basement where you can then connect through this underground tunnel here to Longworth and then through this underground tunnel here. It's all connected into Rayburn if you were heading over to Rayburn. And then you go into Rayburn, you take the elevator up to whichever floor you need to go to. Um, now if you're walking from the house side down here to the Senate side up here, we have the we do have the chart available. But if you do choose to walk, um, it, it's you know hopefully it's not going to be too hot for us. We're really hoping the weather agrees. Um, but at least we won't have rain. Um, so w the the fastest way to go is probably if you're in Cannon, for example, you want to take this entrance here or this exit here, and you can cut through in front of on this New Jersey Avenue, and you can cut across the Capitol Building here. And this is pretty flat. And then you can pop out over here and head over to site. Now sometimes, just a heads up, sometimes this area is closed from security. So it, it, so it depends on, um, on a lot of different factors, like if the vice president is coming to Congress or various other things like that, if Congress is in session, if other VIPs are there. Sometimes this can be closed down to foot traffic. It's always closed down to cars. But sometimes it can be closed down to foot traffic as well. So I recommend if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna come out this way, kind of eyeball it, look over here, see if it looks open or closed. And if it's closed, then you want to come over here to First Street and walk down First Street to get to the Senate side, and vice versa. If you're coming out the Senate Senate side, going down to the House side, First Street um, right here, it's a little faster. But you can try to cut through if you're heading over like the Rayburn for a day. But sometimes this is closed. Um, another thing I wanted to point out to our folks um, is that these side paths here are steep. They go up and downhill. These look um, and because down here underneath the Capitol building is the Capitol Visitor Center. So um, these actually go down into the Capitol Visitor Center um, and can be somewhat steep and burn a little bit of energy if that's what you're trying to avoid. 
So, um, so if you do find yourself out this way, and again, this cuts all the way through, it's pretty flat, um, but if you do find yourself trying to cut through one of these pathways, just be aware that they do have a slope to them. Um, great, okay, I think that's everything on the Capitol Hill map, and again, I'll send out this information so that everybody can see. Oops, I'm gonna move in my spot there. There we go, let me get back to, boom, okay. So, um, so all this information will be sent out to everybody. And then, of course, if, um, for the folks um, on Tuesday afternoon that have some extra time, our meeting at the MWE building is kind of just up here in between Union Station. It's just slightly off the map in between Union Station and the Senate side. Um, it's a short walk over here if you want to take some pictures at the Supreme Court. The Library of Congress has some open exhibits for Tuesday afternoon that are truly interesting. Um, you can also go to the secondary building here at the Library of Congress. Um, always some really cool stuff there. And I also highly recommend, this is my personal, if you have the energy for it, the Botanical Garden is truly lovely. I really enjoy that. I always try to take my friends up from out of town to the Botanical Garden. They have each thing divided by, or each segment divided by the areas of the country, and it's truly a, a really fun experience. Um, okay, so uh, here we go. Just a couple of safety and resources um, as you're moving around Capitol Hill. Um, folks in folks in Washington D.C. definitely jaywalk. They often cross illegally against the light. Um, if you want to join the locals and go ahead and jaywalk, do so at your own risk. The taxi drivers do not care one lick, and they will <laughs> they run people over. So, um, so if you do choose to jaywalk as you're crossing the streets, just be very careful doing so. Make sure to check check the streets carefully. Um, another just kind of thing, especially for folks who are um, who are in wheelchairs. Um, there's a lot of potholes um, and especially kind of curb gaps. So just mind your mind your path as you move along because um, sometimes they can be a little bit bumpy or, um, or uneven. Um, another thing I just want to point out that if you are feeling wiped out or if you are crashing, please stop. If you just can't make any more meetings, it's okay. I don't want you to try and push through just for us. We have lots of advocates and we have flexible scheduling, so please call us and we'll accommodate your meeting if you can't make it um, and we'll find somebody to substitute for you. Um, and, and if you just need to call us, please do. Um, just let us know. Um, just a, a security notice, um, this is kind of, it, it's inconsistent, so I don't, but, I, but it is on the website that no outside food, beverages, or water bottles um, can go through security or just no liquids in general. An empty water bottle is allowed to go through security, and it's okay to purchase them once you have them inside, but if you need to, say, go out of one building and into another and back through security, they might make you fill out again as you come back through. So um, if you have some food items or some uh, or the heavy items that you don't want to work around through the day, feel free to leave your, your valuables or your food at the Command and Control Center. Um, we'll have somebody there at all times, so you can always um, feel safe leaving your items there. Um, another item is that sitting in hallways is okay. You know, people might look at you, but you're welcome to sit. It's not it's not against the rules to sit down inside the hallways. Sometimes they do get a little finicky about if you lie down in the hallway, but you can sit down and that's fine. Um, and then this is another kind of secret that's a little unknown about DC. There are bathrooms on every floor. They're not public bathrooms on every floor, but there are bathrooms on every floor. So if you find yourself in a, in a bad spot, an emergency, and you don't want to have to walk down three flights of stairs or try to get to an elevator to get around to the public bathroom and you just really, you really need to use the bathroom and you don't have the energy to make it to the public bathroom, just ask the closest office that you happen to be by. They usually have keys. And if you're just polite and you say, you know, I'm really sick, I'm not feeling well, I really need a bathroom, can you please let me use the, the bathroom on this floor? They usually are pretty nice about opening it up and, and, and giving the keys or, or at least opening it up for you so you can use the bathroom that may not be a public bathroom on that floor. Um, and then just as an FYI for the folks who, um, who might need medical attention, there is actually the Office of the Attending Physician, who is a full medical, like borderline hospital level staff available just for people on Capitol Hill, including the staff and, their, and the members themselves. They have, I think, 22 nursing staff and 17 full-grade Navy uh, medical personnel on staff at any <clears> given time. Um, so that's the phone number of the Office of the Attending Physician. So if you do find yourself in need of an attending physician, um, that's the phone number you can call from, from uh, and, and get access to those services on Capitol Hill. Um, so just a quick review. Um, you will be, these are items that I didn't want to say publicly because we are recording this and putting this online, but you will receive the organizer's cell phone numbers 
you'll receive your personalized meeting schedule and, um, and the meeting cover sheets, these are the items that will be emailed to you directly. Um, and we also have a Facebook group for those who haven't joined already, um, and that's the link to it down there, um, so that you can communicate and coordinate with, um, with your fellow advocates. Um, so that's a little bit of a walkthrough of our DC logistics, um, and we're going to open it up real here for questions uh, real Emily, quickly. Emily, Emily, if I may, I'm thinking that maybe we shouldn't take questions at this point because it's already 3.30. So just do all the questions at the end to make sure we get through the rest of the agenda. And yeah, about that. And I didn't realize we, the time. That sounds great. Let's move right along then. Okay. So um, this, uh, and um, given we're running a little bit behind time, so I'm going to uh, truncate the discussion a little bit. This is the description of materials in your package. And the key materials that you're going to want to point out during your briefings is the one-page fact sheet, which contains the most details, and the flyer about the Capitol Hill briefing. But I think all the materials will be self-explanatory. So the next slide, Emily, please. So um, I'm going to quickly review about how to prepare for your meeting. This is going to be uh, a truncated version of what we did for the district meetings. So if you do want to get um, more background information that we may not be able to cover today, then I would encourage you to go to the YouTube channels at the beginning slides, which have the um, district trainings. And in particular, uh, one of the things we did in each of the trainings was to tell a personal story. So if you want to have a sense about how to tell your story in greater detail than what I'm going to review now, then I would encourage you to go to those YouTube webinars. So preparing for a meeting. Um, the most important thing is to think about how you will tell your story. Personal stories make a huge difference, much more than any dry recitation of the facts. Hearing it one-on-one -on -one just is incredibly impactful. So really think about how you're going to do it and practice your presentation. You do need to prepare to be brief. As Emily mentioned, the meeting is 20 minutes. If there are two of you, which is likely in each meeting, telling your stories, then I would really try and hone it to just three minutes um, doing that, which is hard. But that's another reason why it's really important to practice. Um, third point is do your research. To be honest, given all the materials we did, I don't think you have to do much independent research other than knowing how many people uh, have NCFS in your district or your state and the financial impact in your district and, and state. Other than that, the only research you would need to do is something that is pertinent to your personal story. And um, Gail, if I just jump in quickly, yes. um, that information will be on everybody's uh, meeting cover sheet. So we'll break down the, uh, the different economic impacts, the prevalence numbers for the district of the person you're meeting with. So especially for the folks who are meeting with districts that may not be their own, all that information will be on the meeting cover sheet. Okay. Uh, four is to review all the materials uh, that you will be leaving behind. You won't be getting those materials until Tuesday morning, but they are already on the website, so you can start looking at them now. Uh, five, I mentioned checking your facts and practicing. Um, and if you have business cards, please bring them because uh, the congressional staff love to collect business cards. And if you don't have a business card, just make sure that you have printed out something with your personal contact information. So if they want to get in touch with you by email or telephone, they know how to reach you. Emily, you, anything you want to add before the next slide? Um, no, okay. I think that covers it pretty, pretty strongly. <laughs> okay, so the next slide, if you want to print out at home, is a truncated version of the essential facts that are on the one pager. So this is just a little shorter version, and you should definitely be familiar with them so that um, depending upon how the conversation is going and what the staffer knows or doesn't know, you can decide which of these facts is most relevant for you to point out in the meeting. Um, typically, certainly, the number of Americans afflicted 
for many offices, it has been very relevant to know that this predominantly affects women. Certainly mentioning the economic impact is very important. And uh, mentioning the low funding, I would say, are really key to point out. Next slide, please. So best practices during your meeting. Uh, since there will be at least two people in every meeting, uh, you can take turns with taking notes. We all know that it's very hard to talk and take notes at the same time, but having the most information about how the staff is responding to what you're saying is incredibly helpful and something that uh, both of our organizations really want to collate so that we know how to plan our next steps. So please definitely give us that feedback. Uh, second point is to be positive. Uh, do not make any assumptions about the attitudes, knowledge, whatever of the staff person you're meeting with. Even assuming what their political party is, Democratic staff, some uh, Democratic supporters sometimes vote for Republicans and vice versa. So it's dangerous to, to make any assumptions. Um, it's also really important to be positive. Uh, all of us have had so many unfortunate experiences that it's very tempting to say the government has ignored this disease for 30 years. But unfortunately, being negative can turn people off and make us just seem like complainers, which we certainly aren't. So for example, rather than saying the government has ignored this disease for 30 years, you can just neutrally say there has been very little government funding for 30 years. Or for example, you don't want to say this typifies the way women have been treated by the medical profession historically. You just want to point out that this is a disease that has a significant impact on women. Third is to listen, which is always a good idea, and not to interrupt. You may hear people saying things that upset you, offend you, but it's important not, not to rise to debate, but to calmly and gently correct them with kindness. For example, um, if the staff person says, oh, gee, I'm really, really tired. I know what you mean, rather than saying, no, you have no idea, to say, I am sorry to hear that you're tired, but actually, my illness is quite different. Let me tell you how. Um, point five, refer to your lead behind. You can tell them that additional information is in the packet of information you left them, and of course, you are available if they have any follow-up questions. Six, as in any meeting, it's a great idea to make eye contact and make a connection. I wouldn't worry that much about this. We're meeting with staff who are trained to be polite and respectful of constituents. So I think you will feel comfortable in the meeting. Certainly some people are warmer than others and you know more effusive. Um, but I, I do think you'll be able to make that connection. And Lastly, for this slide, is don't be afraid to ask questions. They may throw out an abbreviation for a government agency, or you don't even know what it is. And you can easily say, I'm sorry, can you please explain what your reference uh, is? I'm not familiar with that. Emily, anything? Um, no, that was a great, a great coverage. Um, I, I think the, um, the don't be afraid to ask questions is something I'd really highlight. And then one other thing I'd note is that we do have eight member level meetings. So these are folks that will be meeting with the member themselves, um, not just the staff. So um, basically all of these same rules apply to the member um, if you, as opposed to staff. Um, but one other thing that you can add when you're having a member level meeting is that um, it can be a bit more directed because you can you're talking to the man himself or the woman herself, not just the staff. So all staff will often be like, "Well, I need to run that by the member," but you're talking to the buck stops with them. So when you're when you're having that same conversation, all of these still apply. But if you if, you, if you're taking that next step to the member, you can say to that next level of, "You can make a difference here, and this is your district and your people," and you can really hammer at home with a little bit more oomph because, you know, there, there's, none, there's not that buffer between the staff and the member themselves. Yeah, great point. Great point. 
Okay, next slide. Uh, sample storytelling do's and don'ts. Uh, be honest, your story is going to be compelling. You don't need to exaggerate it or change it to have an impact. Just speak from your heart and certainly what Emily and I saw in March is people are really stunned to hear the stories. As I mentioned before, don't be negative. Just try and state things as neutrally as you can, except, of course, for describing your own feelings about your experience. Uh, do make it personal. Try not to get distracted. It's easy to go off on a tangent, let's say, about why is it that FDA hasn't approved any drugs, but really just try and focus in on your message and link it to the ask. So, for example, um, you might you know, want to say, close by saying, I've been ill for 15 years, um, and I am stunned that I still have never found any treatment that helps my symptoms alone cure them. Or I've been ill for 15 years, and there's still no answer about what causes any CFS or how to treat it, which is why research funding is so important for this illness. And again, if you want more examples about the storytelling, uh, go to the previous webinars where both Emily and I did dry runs of storytelling. So next slide. Oh, Emily, I see. Oh, OK. So here's the sample outline for the meeting. Uh, profusely thank uh, the member staff for the meeting, particularly if it's the member. Um, with, and then you'll have initial small talk and introducing yourself and exchanging business cards. You should definitely tell the neighborhood that you're living in. And if there's some connection to the member uh, or, or the staff, you should mention it. Like, you know, our children went to the same school, or I was president in the PTA, or I led my church group in this. If you don't have that connection, fine. But if you do, it's a good idea to mention it. You should also mention that you're here both as a as a, a patient or family member, but you're also working with uh, national groups as part of the national advocacy campaign. And again, please make sure to get the name and contact information of all the people that you're meeting with and share it with us afterwards. Next slide. So a good way to start out is to ask the people you, you're meeting with, are you familiar with MECFS? Because then that gives you a good idea about how much of the facts you want to get into. Um, under three, we say there's five minutes about sharing the big picture about the disease. And if you go back to that page we had several um, slides ago of the essential facts, that's a good point to bring that in. Um, you can definitely ask them if they know someone with MECFS or other chronic illnesses. And in fact, another way of approaching that is to say, you probably know someone with MECFS, and either you don't know that they have it, or they don't know that they have it, because so few people have been diagnosed. And Emily and I were stunned that in two of our meetings, uh, the staff people realized they had a personal connection. One, in response to my question, said, oh my god, I think my mother has had this. And we just thought that she was complaining. And I think she has MECFS. And the other person said, oh, my mother's been diagnosed with lupus. But now I'm thinking that she has MECFS. So that certainly raised their antenna. Um, as we mentioned, you should share the, just the district statistics for MECFS. Emily will be putting that on your, uh, in your packet, so you will have that, and you can refer them to the fact sheet for more details and to, and to all the materials in the packet. And then you would tell your story. We're saying five minutes. If it was one person, maybe, but since there will be two people, you should really be honing it down to just three minutes each. And then and one other thing I'd like to share, um, in terms of that question, do you know somebody with MECFS, um, one of the, the kind of factoids that I like to use that I think has been very effective um, is that statistically our, our prevalence is about 1 in 200. 
So, um, so when, when I ask somebody if you know somebody, and they're like, well, if you have 200 Facebook friends, you probably know somebody with this disease, but they don't know it, or, or maybe they just haven't told you that they have it, because most people are very private about it. Um, and, and so I love that, like, if you have 200 Facebook friends, you know somebody with this disease, and that usually kind of gets them to sit up and take notice a little bit. Yeah, great statistic. Okay. Next slide. Um, okay, Emily, take it away. Yeah, thank you. Um, so these are our asks for this campaign. Um, it takes, a, I would say, about five minutes to go through these. And so this is all based on a 20-minute meeting. Um, so it's, it's very quick. Um, the first one is the shortest and easiest. So you always start with, I guess, what we call the low-hanging fruit first. So the first thing is, you know, please, we want you to get educated and learn more about MECFS. Senator Markey is hosting a briefing. To, in this case, it'll be tomorrow, so you'll be meeting with them on Wednesday. So you say tomorrow on Thursday, May 18th, there will be a briefing. Please send a member of your staff or join yourself if you can to learn more about this disease. And then you can always plug, we're providing lunch. Can hit nudge, nudge, free lunch. Come join us. Um, the second ask is, um, is when we really get in the, the next two asks are really policy asks. So the first one is we want the, the member to write or call Director Francis Collins at the NIH and request that MECFS be a funding priority for the $2 billion increase that they just received um, in, in fiscal year 17. And FY stands for fiscal year, so fiscal year 17. Um, that's the first ask. Uh, the second ask is we're asking our, our, our members to oppose the elimination of the Prevention and Public Health Fund, which is abbreviated as PPHF. Um, this funding is currently used to support all of our programming at the CDC. So if that fund disappears, we are very likely to lose our funding at the CDC. And then uh, another talking point, which is not on the slide on this particular note, is that the CDC is currently running a multi-site study, which is in its final fifth year, fifth year of a five-year study. And if they zero out the funding now, they lose all of the investment of the previous four years. So, um, so it's just wasting government resources to, to stop a study right before it's done. Um, so those are our two main talking points. So again, write and call. Director Francis Collins and ask him for MACFS funding priority and oppose the elimination of the Prevention and Public Health Fund to preserve our programming at the CDC. Oh, um, and then Gail, are you, uh, the, we'll do the wrap-up. Oh, okay. That's I, thought this, I thought you were doing the wrap-up. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry. My, my apologies. Um, so, um, and so after you make the ask, that's kind of like the crescendo of your presentation. So it's really like, this is what we need you to do. Please do it. Um, so your wrap-up kind of folds into following up your ask. Um, so generally, the staffer will say something like, oh, this sounds really great. I'll talk to my boss. Um, so try to follow up with information about who is their boss and what position that is and what person that is and see if you can make your way up the food chain and talk to that person as well. Um, of course, as you're, um, as you're working in your teams, as one person is talking, the other person should definitely take notes and vice versa. Um, so try to gain as firm a commitment from the individual as you can. So if they say, um, and you say, please contact the director, Francis Collins, and ask him to, to take action and, and prioritize MECFS funding. And if they say, oh, okay, well, we'll think about it. It's like, no, can, can I hear back from you by Thursday of next week? Oh, I don't know if that's so soon. How about Thursday of the following week? Can I can I get a response from your boss about why he won't do this? And so try to be you know polite but but relentless and firm that you want a response um, and don't let them give you some kind of wishy-washy political answer. Um, try to make sure they get some kind of commitment for either a firm date for follow-up or or that they will absolutely contact you with the response you know at, at a certain time. Um, also, always ask if you can keep in touch and send additional information. They will almost always say, I don't think I've ever heard a staffer say, no, I don't want additional information. So I'll, uh, so always say, may I contact you with additional information and provide you follow-up? And they will say yes, and then make sure you get their contact information if you haven't already gotten it at that point. Um, and again, lots of profuse thanking. Um, these staffers, you know, I used to be a staffer, and, and it's, it's a thankless job. You have a lot of people who are yelling at you, and, 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 you know, and it's always your fault, and it can be rough. Um, and so, again, the polite and thanks, it makes a huge difference. You know, thank them for the good work that they're doing um, and, and, and a lot of the sacrifices that they sometimes have to make 
And, um, and definitely, again, that kind of pulls into that don't be negative and don't be, don't be accusatory because a lot of people don't realize it, but we use a lot of you-centered statements. So, like, you haven't done that, even though it's really broader than that, and that poor staffer is just doing their job. So um, it's one of the reasons why we, we really caution about that language because if that staffer is just having a bad day, didn't have their coffee that morning, you know, that'll affect how they report your, your, this meeting back up the food chain. Um, so always make them feel really warm and appreciated at that last moment. That'll really stick with them as they're writing up their reports about um, what their recommendations are for the, as a result of this meeting. Um, one thing uh, that I want to mention, we decided not to distribute it to everybody because I think it would just be too confusing. But we do have in our back pocket letters for them to send um, to about appropriations and a letter to NIH. So it may be that if a particular meeting is going well and Emily and I are in it, that we may pull this out of our back pocket. But more oh, likely absolutely. it's something that more likely we would use it as follow up after the meeting. Absolutely. And and that's something we'll we'll talk about with some of our more experienced advocates. And that's something that um, you'll just kind of have to go with your instinct about how well the meeting is going. Um, because if you go something that forward, it could turn people off. So it's one of those, um, it'll be very successful if it works well, but you don't want to do it if it's not the right moment. Um, so we'll have those available. And if you, you feel that, the, that in your, in your follow-up and they're just like, oh, absolutely, and they're just, they are on board and they're excited and they're ready to take action, you know, we'll have these items available. We'll have a sample letter to appropriations. We'll have a sample letter to the NIH. We'll have a sample resolution. And if you feel that this meeting is going well enough, that this person would be receptive to one of those, um, we ha we'll, we'll have them available. And you can just kind of keep a handful with you. Um, and, and if, we, and if you, this is the right staffer and this is the right time, feel free to pull those out and say, by the way, here's a sample letter if you, uh, to get you started on your, on your path. Um, and that can be very positive. And another thing is, we're, we're, as I think you all know, we're looking for supporters, but we're also looking for more leaders on Capitol Hill. So, you know, if you get the sense in the meeting that somebody really might be willing to step forward and take a leadership role, certainly pass that on to us so that we can pursue that in the future. Absolutely. Um, so then in terms of follow-up, um, the, we will have a meeting evaluation form available for you. It'll come um, as part of your packet for each meeting. Um, so generally, I, I, some people fill these out as the meeting is going on. Um, it's really your personal preference. I prefer to fill them out afterwards, but, um, but I know some people really think it's better to do it during, so whatever works best for you. Um, they, they will be handwritten. Unfortunately, we don't have a digital version. Um, so please return it to our team at the Command and Control Center, or if, you're, if it's your last meeting for the day and you are, you are getting out of Dodge, um, just like take a picture of it on your cell phone or maybe scan it and email it to us. Um, you can always at, at congress at meaction.net so that we have a copy of what your meeting evaluation form was and, um, and get that information back to us. Um, I also, in terms of follow-up, I highly recommend um, a follow-up call or email to the person you met with just to say thanks. And if something came up in the meeting that you weren't un unable to answer, they asked you, uh, what are the neurological components of the disease? And you know, you just don't know that off the top of your head. Um, you can either let us know, and we can do the research and send them the correct information, or you can do it yourself. You're welcome to. And then say, Bye, you know, thank you so much for the meeting. By the way, the answer to your question was blah. And you can send that as a follow-up. And it's a great opportunity to, again, expand that, that conversation and that dialogue um, to start building a strong relationship there. Gail, was there anything on follow-up you wanted to ask? No, um, I don't think so. Unfortunately, there's not much time for questions, but you can uh, email us. I mean, we have five minutes, and then uh, you can email Congress and MEAction.net or Emily or both of us if you have any questions that we're unable to answer today or Tuesday. But Emily probably has some questions now. Hello? Okay, so it looks like we unmuted somebody Ooh. there. Um, so let's see if I can get... Oh goodness, somebody's got some great music going. Um, okay, sorry, you get to see all this kind of background um, going on. So I see a question from, um, let's see, no raised hand. Oh, we got a raised hand from Rochelle. I see your hand is raised. Rochelle, I'm going to unmute you right now uh, and go ahead and ask your question. Maybe? 
Maybe if I call it me. Um, no. Okay. So I, sorry for the technical difficulties there. Um, Rochelle, I saw your hand went down. Let's see. Uh, Martina, I see your hand is up. Let me see if I can unmute you. There we go. Martina, you are live. Hi, Emily. Can you hear me? I can. Hello, Martina. Yeah. Hello. I just wanted to say, I, at the district meetings, I used all your information that was there, and I luckily I used your storyline, and it's one to tell everybody it's um, very easy, and it worked really well, and they were very receptive, so I hope at this next meeting that we will get supporters from my district. So I just want to thank you. Oh, thank you, Martina. Um, all right, uh, Rochelle, I see your hand is back up again. Let me see if I can get you unmuted here. Um, Let's see. It looks like you are self-muted, um, but Rochelle, if you could unmute yourself, we'll, we'll be ready to hear you. No, no. Okay. Oh, there we go. Rochelle, you're you're live now. Rochelle. No. Okay. Oh, is that you, Rochelle? Can we hear you now? No, I'm sorry, Rochelle, I can't hear you. I'm going to go ahead and put you back on mute, but please just type in your question in the question box, and we will get to it. We have a couple of questions in the question box. Let me get those out really quick. All right. Um, oh, Natasha, I see you have a question here. Which entrance to Canon is closest to the designated MECFS room? That is a great question. Um, I'm not 100% sure, honestly, because I haven't been in this particular room before, but let me pull up the map here again real quickly. Um, so, and let me get my fancy laser pointer. <laughs> um, so this is Canon right here, if I, and, and we're on the fourth floor. There are three entrances, one here on the south side by the metro, one here on the New Jersey entrance side, and then one on the north side of New Jersey. Um, what I'd recommend doing in terms of coming into the building is if you're coming from the metro, just go straight to the to the closest entrance um, and then when you walk in you know you can you're gonna have to circle the block anyways and you can figure out which side the signs will tell you which way is closest but there's a bank of elevators if I remember correctly right in this side here and then there's also a bank of elevators on this side kind of on the far side um, so that will get you up to the fourth floor and um, and then you can just navigate from there I find it's easier um, so instead of walking around the outside of the building, which is always a little bit further, and you're outside of the air conditioning, and it can be hot and uncomfortable, just get to go to the closest entrance to the correct building, get inside the building, and then navigate your way from there. Um, so thank you so much for that question. Um, are we going to be able to print these slides out for reference? Absolutely. So we're going to make PDF versions of these slides. And, um, and they'll be on the website. Again, that website is um, on the Solve MECFS website go to um, the Get Involved tab, and then the very first thing under Get Involved is MECFS Advocacy Week, and there's a whole list of everything with links to download, and we'll make sure the slides are up there. And we can also email out a copy to everybody when I send your individualized schedules as well. I'll make sure, I'm going to make a note right now to send out the PowerPoint slides when, I, when we do the emails. And I'll also make sure the link to the map is on there as well, because I find this is one of the best maps I've found for navigating Capitol Hill. Um, let's see, what other questions do we have? Um, sometimes in telling my story and talking about my son, I tear up. Are tears to be avoided? You know, I personally, I tear up a lot too, um, and I think that's fine. I mean, as long as they're not crocodile tears, as long as you're being genuine, I think that emotion really emphasizes the, the, the experience, and, um, and I think staffers understand and are empathetic to that. I, I've never had a moment with an advocate who ended up in tears being disparaged or treating badly. Um, it, you know, these, these, these staffers know that your experience is authentic when you're, when you're you know, tearing up. Um, and so I don't think you should try to stifle your tears. Um, again, I, I, just, I, I, I just think it's about the authenticity. It's about the realism of your experience. And if that realism brings tears, then, then let them fly. Um, but I wouldn't, you know, no, no crocodile tears. <laughs> um, if we already RSVP'd to Chris for Tuesday morning, do you still want us to email info to Emily for the security list? Oh, that's a great question, Michelle. Um, so, no, that's all right. Chris, is, Chris and I are working together, so we're sharing that information. So if you've emailed him your information, then I have it too. 
and I'll make sure to get it um, get it to the security so they have their way in. Um, and then just to be clear, um, so the folks who have not yet emailed their name and information for attending the in-person briefing, please do so to myself or Chris, which is smiley at solvecfs.org, um, so that we can get your name on that security list. Um, and if you are not, if for some reason you, you haven't RSVP'd with us and your name does not end up on the list, that doesn't mean you can't come. It just means they're going to have to go through all the extra hoops of the extra security screening, which just is, you know, we, we don't want to waste your time like that. Um, so just please, if you could email us so that we have the, um, the, your name on the list, that'll make it, every, make it faster for you and for us and for everybody. So you can come up and have a quick breakfast. Um, I think that's all the questions. I don't think I missed any. Um, let me see if there were any other hands that were raised. We're coming to the top of the hour, so I know we... Um, all right, I see no other hands raised, and I think we got to all the questions. So, of course, as always, let me go to the last slide here again, um, just so that you have our email information in case you don't have it already. Um, you can always email me directly at etaylor at solvecfs.org, um, or you can email Gail directly at congress at meaction.net, and or um, is it Gail at meaction.net as well? Yes, yeah, you can do gail at meaction.net. And um, we're three minutes over the hour, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. But thank you all so much for joining us. We're so excited to see you in D.C. And some of you yeah. meet you for the first time. So excited. So thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. And um, we'll, we'll see you in D.C. Have a great, great weekend.